Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Teresa. And we are the co-authors of the book, Pass the Baton, Empowering All Music Students. Our goal is to share stories of educators who are passing the baton and empowering their music students. We want to help teachers create music lessons that transform students from passive consumers to vibrant creatives. Welcome back to the Pass the Baton podcast. We're here to talk about all things student empowerment and music education. Before we introduce today's guest, we want to remind you to follow or subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. In addition, if you like what you hear today, please consider leaving a rating or review. That's what helps podcasts like Pass the Baton grow. I am so excited for today's guest. Um, Angela and I met officially in person a few months ago and have become friends. And I just, I love everything about her, everything that she does and the conversation, her enthusiasm is contagious. Like I I even said to her, I want to come join your orchestra. (laughs) She just seems like that much fun. Totally. And um, I think what I really loved about our conversation was the strategy she gives uh, for teachers of how to empower her English English language learners, but as well as how they just how those strategies work to empower any student in your classroom. Yeah, absolutely. It was a good one. All right. Welcome back, everybody. It's so good. Good to be here with you. Um, we are excited about today's guest, Angela Ammerman. I'm, I got to meet you. I guess you're an online friend, we'll say, right? <laughs> Which is wonderful. And then we've had the opportunity to meet in person, and it's just great to have her here. So, Angela, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you both. Yay. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're up to these days? Yes. So I have wanted to be a music teacher my whole life. And when I was a little girl, I would line up all of my dolls and I would teach them to sing while my mom was upstairs teaching piano lessons. So I have just had a lifetime of like trying to be a good teacher and watching amazing teachers and seeing what they do and just like soaking every little bit of it up. And, you know, all of that has kind of led me to some phenomenal experiences, including, um, you know, as a middle school student. I actually got to teach private lessons. And so I got some really incredible early teaching experiences. And I did it for the kids in my neighborhood for $5 a half an hour. Uh, And those lessons were were huge for me, selfishly, personally, uh, as a musician, but also as, as a music educator. And it built this amazing identity. And then it also gave me just like this really great Um, sense about building community and that music is a great vehicle for that. And that has shaped so much of the rest of my life. Uh, And then in in high school, I actually had a really another huge uh, experience where I couldn't afford to go to like summer music camps, like all of my other friends. And my music teacher suggested that instead I actually go to a, a string camp and as a counselor. And so at that string camp, they actually had me running sectionals and teaching small private lessons and then working under the direction of this incredible conductor, Laura Jost, who um, is one of my favorite people ever. And I I just learned so much from her and from being there and and all of those like very early experiences. Those are actually the most powerful of, of, you know, my entire teaching career, not my not my undergrad, not my master's. None of it, it has has matched up to those early experiences. So. To make a long story short, those led to me getting a PhD eventually in music education and uh, to taking a tenure track job at in Tennessee and then eventually deciding we wanted to have kids and moving to George Mason University where I teach one day a week. And now I stay at home the rest of the week with my little one and a half year old son. And so that's it's it's really a dream come true. And eventually I'll go back to teaching full time, most likely. Um, but right now I get to do what I love so much, which is you know, learning from other great music educators, mentoring young future music teachers, uh, and then staying home with my son. So I'm, I'm really living, living the dream right now. Sounds awesome. And so exciting. It does. Um, so how did you become interested in the English language learners? I know you, you have a passion for that. Where, how did that come about? It was something that I never saw coming, actually. I mean, I've always been super passionate about building community and about reaching out to underserved populations because growing up not being able to afford lots of things that other kids could, I I recognized like, 
all of these people that just kind of helped me and um, said, no, 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 money is not an excuse. Like you need to do this because there's something special about you. And these people like really just lifted me up. And so I've had a great passion for doing the same for others. Um, And eventually I ended up teaching in Fairfax County at Annandale High School. Um, Annandale High School still is one of the most diverse schools in the entire country. It's Uh, it was shocking how many translations of different posters you would see in the hallway. You'd walk around. And I remember when I first got there, I was like, I need to count how many different languages are present here. And it was just mind blowing. Uh, When I first came to Annandale, we had a very prevalent um, Korean population. And then over time, a very short period of time, actually that transition to even more diverse um, with many Hispanic students as well. And At one point, my guidance counselor came up to me and was like, I have this kid who's dying to play violin, but she doesn't speak English. And we didn't have a beginner orchestra. And she said, can I just, can I just stick her in orchestra and you'll teach her? And I was like, yes, let's do this. Like, what am I thinking? But I was like, yes, let's do it. I've got amazing students. I know they can help me with this. Um, We're going to make this work. So she was my very first English language learner. Um, and we didn't, I did not speak Korean and she did not speak English, like none. Uh, and now I know she knew more than she verbalized. I, I, she, she certainly had more. Um, but to me, she never, she, for a whole year, I don't think I heard her say anything except miss. She would just say, yes, miss. Yes, miss. Um, and, and so though that first experiences with her, she actually, she did, phenomenally well in that beginning orchestra and the guidance counselor of course was like okay can I send you some more can I send you some more can I send you some more and by the time I was getting ready to leave Annandale sadly I had a full beginning orchestra class all by itself um, of almost all English language learners and then many of my advanced students were actually TAs for that class so they were doubling up on orchestra they were playing a secondary instrument helping to teach my English language learners. And um, most of those students actually, of course, went on to major or minor in music as uh, unsurprisingly. But so those experiences were like tremendous and really showed me that music for our English language learners is communication. And um, it's so powerful for these kids that like come into this brand new country with very little money knowing very few people, especially within the school that they're, they're attending. Um, and music is just a, a powerhouse uh, for their social identity and sense of belonging. And as I saw all of those things kind of coming together, I just, I, I just like became more and more passionate about it um, to the point where then I ended up going to uh, a, a after, afterwards when I was at the University of Tennessee at Martin, I ended up going to a, uh, a children's home in Thailand. And I started a strings program there. And to actually, I actually did like a little research project to test some of the strategies I had used at Annandale um, with a group of students who also didn't speak English. Um, And I tested kind of those strategies. And what we discovered was incredible. Like their their self-concept just skyrocketed after only 10 days of intensive music study. Uh, And they were saying things to their translators later uh, when we were asking like do you notice changes in math class or in you know these different classes they were taking one of the common themes with it was that they were falling asleep less often in their other classes and we actually know that that's an indicator of an improvement in self-concept not only in the music world but in academics it was incredible to see what you know, studying music could do for these children. And so it just kind of like fueled my passion for English language learners. Wow. That, that is so, it's so exciting to hear and it's, yeah, it's inspiring. So, you know, you're talking about these different strategies and it sounds like they're strategies that are not only, you know, getting the kids engaged with music, but you're really empowering them to, to be musicians. Can you tell us, so what, what are some of the strategies? Like, what would you, what would you suggest? Absolutely. Well, one of the first ones actually is, is similar to what you were saying. You, you said um, something about inspiring these musicians. And this is really key. Um, you know, well, first, I believe very, very, very strongly that we must learn our students' names and say them properly. This is very challenging with some of our English language learners. It, it is. And many of them won't tell us if we say their names wrong. So one 
pre-strategy, I would say, to even like uh, your core work with your English language learners is to set yourself up um, as a true support of your English language learners and learn their names. So when you first meet them, say your name, um, you know, Miss Angela, and, and then, you know, direct your hands, outstretch your hands to them and ask them. And if they don't understand it, do it again, Miss Angela and respond. And then they'll eventually get it, but have an audio recorder with you mm. and then practice those names. I, when I was in Thailand, I remember I stayed up until like two in the morning practicing these children's names so that I could say them properly. And when I did, their eyes just lit up. But in addition to learning their names and saying them properly and using them frequently, I feel it's very, very important instead of referring to our students as students or kids that we refer to them as musicians, because as you said, we need to build them up as musicians from the very, very beginning. We want them to identify strongly with what we do and that they belong with us. So we refer to them as musicians violinist, cellist, flutist, whatever it is that they're playing um, in your class. I think it's very, very important to refer to them as musicians. Um, in terms of uh, the way we teach them uh, is very much like a lot of call and response and verbal, uh, nonverbal communication. Um, and I, 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 feel, I feel that that's very, very important for not just our English language learners, but for our students in general. In terms of empowering our ELLs, you know, um, one of our contributors uh, for, the, for this book that I have actually that's out, uh, Tony Sousa, he talks about having students run all these cables for a concert. Like he does a modern band. So there are just tons and tons of cords and cables and all kinds of electronics. And he talks about this one kid who just wasn't that into it, you know, into modern band at the beginning, but he seemed to have an interest in running cables. So he was like, all right, let me let him run cables. So the kid starts running cables. And with very little instruction, this kid starts running more cables to the point where they put on a concert at the end of the year. And Tony, the teacher, has done nothing to set up any of the cables, to set up any of the electronic equipment. This one student has prepared the entire stage for this concert. And, and he, you know, he told me that like, that was such a powerful moment for him as a teacher to like, let go of this, to let the student run with it. But then that student was like king of the program, you know, this kid that doesn't even speak the same language as the rest of them is like, look at what I can do. I mean, how empowering is that? And what we see with so many of our students is that as we give them more responsibility in our classroom, we see them really take ownership over what they do. And it's just, it's incredible to see, to see what, what happens with that. And at, when I was at Annandale High School, we actually had an electric orchestra. I, I uh, just a little quartet. And I remember some of these other teachers would be like, oh, how do you do this? How do you do this? And I was like, I have no idea. And they said, you don't know. And I was like, I seriously have no idea. Like the students run every piece of that electric orchestra, I'm just there giving them feedback and advice. But in terms of the logistics of all of the electronic stuff, I had no idea. Um, and this is something that many of our English language learners can really excel at because like there is something intuitive for some of our students about electronics and technology. And you know, if you sense that this is something they're interested in, let them run with it. So uh, another thing that I feel is a really easy way to kind of empower our ELLs is to encourage them to bring in um, just like on their on their iPhone or on whatever device they use, um, encourage them to bring in a song to lead stretches. Um, and so this is super easy. You can just like hook up to speakers or, or Bluetooth, whatever it is, and they can actually pick the song of the day that you do stretches to. What a great way, especially for like a newcomer ELL who maybe speaks very, very little English. Maybe they have very minimal skills at the moment on uh, the instrument, you don't really know how to kind of bring them in yet because you don't know them yet. What a great, easy way to just get them empowered and to not only like, not only have them feel like they are seen within your lesson plan, but they are actually part of it. Like they're building your lesson plan actively. How powerful is that? It's incredible. Um, and I, I've seen time after time after time, um, these English language learners, as we give them small little roles within the classroom that then they want more and more and more. And then their confidence just 
blooms. It's, it's incredible to see how that works. And, and so that brings me to like my next point, which is establishing student roles um, within your program. And this is, you know, you're, as Teresa said earlier, you can do this for your English language learners. You can do this for your, your English speakers, native English speakers. All of them are going to benefit tremendously from student roles within your classroom. One of the really great roles we established at Annandale was an orchestra artist in every single ensemble. And so this student would come up with different ideas for like designs for t-shirts and for um, concert programs. They don't have to speak English at all to do this. This is actually a really great role for your English language learners and even for your newcomer English language, meaning they've only been in the country for zero to one year. Um, and then for your more fluent ELLs, one of my favorite things to do is to have them arrange sheet music for a beginner accompaniment to your intermediate or advanced group. So for example, um, if my group is playing dragon dances and I have a brand new English language learner, I'm going to encourage one of my fluent English language learners who's been in the program for a while to actually write some easy music to accompany dragon dances. I'm going to give them an example from a different piece. I'm actually going to give them a list of notes that they can play all quarter notes, we're only going to play open strings for this one. Um, and, and then I'll let them go from there. And it has to fit within the chord that's happening. Now, they, of course, have to be fluent musically as well. But those are just some really great tools to, um, to empower your English language learners in your ensemble. And by the way, if you don't have a beginning ensemble, please, 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 please start one or at the very least, make sure it is known to your guidance counselors that you will accept beginners because our English language learners, they come into the classroom, they come into our schools at any point throughout the year, at any point in their, um, in their K-12 life. And I remember this one teacher, this made me so mad. And I don't get mad very easily, but he said, he was like, I don't know why you're even bothering to take these seniors in orchestra. You know, they've never touched the violin. Like, why are you even bothering? And I was like, don't you believe in the power of music? <laughs> and he just kind of looked at me like, oh, this girl. And I said, music has the power to change lives. I remember getting so emotional and so upset. And I said, even if I can only study with this kid for two weeks, I'm doing it. I'm going to bring him into the orchestra and we're going to do the best we can with those two weeks with this kid. Because I believe that strongly in the power of music and in what we can do for our students and what our students can do for us. So anyways, please, please um, just consider bringing in beginners and maybe starting a beginner ensemble eventually at any level, even high school or college. It's awesome. Yeah. I think the thing that I really, I wonder too, that you didn't quite mention, but I wonder if it still happens too, is the community that you're building among these of your beginners and is I'm sure it's got to be contagious, right? That like when they see, you know, so-and-so is really good at chords and so-and-so is really good at the art for the program. And like, it's just a great, I think there's value like kids, even if you didn't do something specific to another child, like they truly value that experience for their friend, you know, or and that, right? Yes, yes <laughs> absolutely. And, and, you know, I say this all the time, actually, passion is contagious. We mm -hmm. see this in our, in our students, but also that this idea of empowering others that you all, you all have a whole book, the whole podcast, is all about empowerment. And, and, you know, that is contagious. And I, I would see it in Thailand. This was incredible. So I was teaching kids from fourth grade to eighth grade um, to play in this strings class. And within two days, I had a student up front teaching, doing what I did, no words, but mimicking me and I was walking around. So I immediately empowered this young woman who was doing really well to kind of take a leadership role. Two days after that, I walk into this atrium area and there's this student with three of the little second graders who were not in my strings class. And she has talked her friends into letting these second graders borrow their violins, which are enormous for these little second graders. It was so cute. And here she is teaching them. And you all, 
it was so wonderful. She taught them um, just a few of the notes to twinkle, twinkle, little star, and then a bow. And so I came in and she, they did the whole thing for me. And I about lost it. Like I just, but that's, that's the thing. It is contagious, not just for your students. Like they see, as you said, oh my gosh, this teacher's investing her time and energy and love into these students. But then they also want to do the same for mm-hmm. others. And man, that is that is how movements are made, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's how revolutions happen. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, and another thing I think, so... So you mentioned that um, the counselor kept coming back to you, right? You know, how about the, here's another one. So what, what do you think um, outsiders of your program, like what benefits did they see to kids that, you know, that got them to kind of keep coming back to you? Did they, did they mention to you things like, you know, you're, this, this trial is different now in other classes or, you know? Well, you know, it's funny, the guidance counselors didn't mention anything to me. They just said, they, they, they said that they so appreciated that I took the students because they said that a lot of other people, what was the word they use? Um, look at them as like, I don't even, I, I forget the, the term that they used, but basically they were taking up space in another class and that broke my heart. And these guidance counselors, it broke their heart too. Cause they were like, we want to find a space for these students where they are valued. And, you know, it's, uh, it's really sad that like, sometimes that was difficult for the guidance counselors to kind of find. And I think they were very surprised when I agreed to it, to be honest with you at, at first, because people have this view of strings programs as being very like uptight and very um, kind of like hoity toity. And um, so I think she was actually very surprised when I agreed to take on this student. And then she and the other, other guidance counselors, once they saw that the student was thriving in my program, she actually was showing up before school, after school, wouldn't say a word, but she'd show up in my class. She'd play piano. She'd play violin. Um, they just, they really, I think, began to believe in, in, in what I was doing. And, and then also what my students were doing, because at this same time, toward the end of this, the, the first year that I started with this English language learner, you know, they started saying, can we send more? Of course they could. So that's when I started asking some of my students, hey, would you be interested, my more advanced students, in doubling up on orchestra so I could have some help in these other classes? So then, of course, the students were going back to the guidance counselors like, hey, can I do this? And that was like unheard of before this time, which, you know, that was just very rare when these students have such busy schedules. They were giving up really, you know, valuable classes to be in two orchestras in a block schedule. Like that's crazy. Uh, And so I think the guidance counselors were just kind of taken aback a little bit. Um, But then what I, what I did see was that the English language teachers were just in love with it. And actually what ended up happening was they kept coming to see me and telling me about all the progress they were seeing in the English language learners' confidence in their test scores, even um, for the WIDA tests. Mm-hmm. And they were just saying that like, they were just seeing tremendous improvement. Uh, and, and it got to this point where they were asking me to actually come speak with all of the English language teachers in the county about the power of music for them and how important musical study can be for those students. And that actually, you know, that was an important moment for me personally, because uh, then I was like, I think, you know, when you're making a difference, right? I think, you know, but when other people start to notice, you're like, oh, I, I really am like, I wasn't making this up. I don't have that much of an inflated ego. Like somebody's noticing that this is really cool. And, and it was. And so um, that really kind of fueled me to kind of continue to search more for better strategies and, and continue to really push to reach all of these different students that, that I was um, bringing in. So yeah, people definitely noticed. And real quick, one of the coolest stories I heard, we were, we were making this video for fourth grade strings um, in, in Fairfax County, they were once again threatening to cut fourth grade strings and we're like, seriously, can we, can, can we figure this out? So we were making a video about how powerful um, strings was for our English language learners. And this one kid, um, he told me that, let's see, what was it? He said, he sat next to the same kid every single day in orchestra and they were best friends. And I was like, wait, when you first came to the country, and he said, yeah. I said, 
you didn't speak English. Did he speak Vietnamese? And he goes, no. And I was like, so he was your best friend. And he said, yes. And I said, did you talk to each other ever? No. And I was like, what? And he goes, we sat together every day and played the same music. He was my best friend. And I was like, A plus B equals C, I guess. I will go for it. And, you know, um, that also kind of let me know that from uh, um, an immigrant's perspective, friendship can look very different than it might look for some of us. Um, and friendship is, is time together in many ways. And so that was also an important kind of mindset that I, that I had to recognize. And he said at the end of our interview, he also said that by the time he was in sixth grade, so from fourth to sixth grade in a strange program, his WIDA test had increased so much that his English language teacher came to him and was like, you're like, you're so good that, you know, you're like a normal kid. And he goes, I'm like a normal kid. And I was like, oh, I didn't know to be like offended for him or happy or like, you know, or like, I, I didn't know how to feel, to be honest, but I just knew that to him, this was a big milestone that he'd, he'd achieved such great language development um, in his time. And he really attributed a lot of that to being in music. It was just incredible to hear, you know, kind of some of the feedback from our students directly. Oh, that's, that's just awesome. I know we keep saying the same thing over and over, but it's true. I love it. So you've talked a ton about you know, obviously how all these strategies and all of these things are so beneficial to the English language learner students. And, and you kind of touched on this a little bit. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Are you saying that some of these strategies are also going to benefit the non-ELL students? All of them. Yes, they all do. It kind of reminds me of like when I would read things about special education, um, advice for teaching students with special, um, different special needs. Mm -hmm. And I remember in college, I remember reading these different things and I'm like, wait, shouldn't all teachers do this with all students? Like, isn't this the goal? But I think that the need is more obvious uh, oftentimes with our different uh, types of learners. And so we kind of gravitate a little bit more to those and a little more uh, of an extreme. But absolutely, all of these strategies are going to be huge for your um, your English language students, but then also your English speaking students. And actually what I've seen a lot of the time is that like our English language, uh, our English speakers, excuse me, our native English speakers, they benefit tremendously also from helping English language learners. There's very much a mutual benefit. And from all of these uh, ways of empowering students, it absolutely builds investment and ownership in your program and in music. Um, it tells our students that they are valued within our school. And, and I have to tell you, like so many of the kids don't feel that they're valued anywhere. Uh, and so that that piece alone from, from trying to add strategies to empower your students, like that piece alone, that value piece is huge for our students. Um, and then it helps them to discover something they're passionate about and good at that they can really continue to take with them for the rest of their lives. It's just tremendously beneficial to all of our students. Oh, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. So um, if you were talking to you know, teachers, which you are right now, obviously, and someone's like, all right, I need to, I need to really think about how I am I'm working with my English language learners. What would you give them as like a, a step one? Now you've mentioned some good ones already, but like, what would you, where would you recommend people start? Well, I, step one for me is to make sure every single student is seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the best easiest ways to do that is simply eye contact. And that sounds so easy. And yet, if you're in a class of 150 students, which some of us teach these massive programs, or you have an elementary general music program where you're seeing 30 kids every 30 minutes, once a week, making eye contact with every single child in your program can actually be very challenging. Um, but I really encourage you to, to actively think about, okay, did I make eye contact with this kid, especially your English language learners? And sometimes they don't want to make eye contact and that's okay. But like, have you made the effort to see them and to let them know that they're seen? And that's, that's where also using their name comes into play. And, and I actually, when I 
um, when I go to like guest conduct or I go to um, these different places to work with children, I actually have like a seating chart usually, or I have a list of the student names. And I, my goal for these weekends or these like one day events is literally to say every single child's name properly. And it's really important to me that I do that because like so much of the time, our students are just not seen, especially after the pandemic. Um, they don't, they don't, they don't feel that they belong sometimes. Um, and just acknowledging their presence is tremendous. Um, and also it's a great classroom management thing too, by the way, but that's a whole different note, but please, please like notice them, notice them. Don't, don't act like they're not there because you don't know how to reach out to them. Don't not say their name because you're afraid you'll say it wrong either. Like, please make the effort. I promise you they're going to so appreciate that you made the effort, even if it's wrong. Um, and, and, and don't beat yourself up. It's, if it's wrong, like you can work on saying it correctly. I would say never, ever, ever underestimate the value in a classroom duty, like putting away chairs, putting away stands, enlist the help of, of one of your newcomer students and just gesture for them with a, come on with me, you know, move your arm toward you. Come on with me. Let's go put these away. Uh, students want to be brought in and they want to, they want to have a, a role in your classroom. Um, if you're going to make some kind of an assumption about an English language learner, assume that they can do something, please. Uh, so oftentimes we we feel like because there's such a, a big communication barrier that maybe we need to like make things a lot easier for them. But actually their intellect is on the same page as the other kids. They just don't have the English words to convey that. Uh, and so I, I strongly encourage you as musicians to hold them to the high, the, the same high standards you hold all your other students to, especially if they're the same level performance wise, right? I mean, if they're a beginner, that's different, of course, but like whatever your standard is for whatever level they are, hold them to that level. Don't dumb it down because they don't speak English. I, I just want to really say that. Um, and then finally, get other students to help you find ways to empower ELLs. And what I mean by that is like, you might not know the English language learner very well, but ask your other students, say like, hey, have you seen Grace at lunch? Like, is there something she's really into? What might she do in our orchestra program? They are other students, even if they don't know, they will hunt them down. Like they will find out, they will go on a mission and they'll be like, we're going to bring her in and we're going to get her. She's going to become an orc dork. I'm telling you, like if you give your students this role to help you empower other students, they are going to be on it. And man, they won't let go until they do it. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> Well, and so I think, um, I guess one question we wanted to ask you is, so that it sounds like, um, well, so we have so many things on our plate as a teacher, right? We've got so many things that we're trying to kind of balance. And we have, uh, we know that, you know, there's a movement to empower our students. And so many of the things that you've given us today are really just uh, great teaching strategies for any learner. Um, how do you balance that when you also have, you know, these, uh, the expectation of a high quality performance? Is there, uh, you know, I guess just how do you do that? Is there, do you feel like you, you can do both? And um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, you absolutely can do both. And I believe it's a slow burn. <laughs> like what I see is that as we empower our students, it leads to this incredible, like increased motivation and loyalty. And then that leads naturally to a fire for music. And what I've seen with every program I've ever worked with is that they naturally develop into this really high caliber performing ensemble. And actually every program I've been at, I've been very passionate about empowering students. I didn't even know, I actually didn't even realize like what I was doing sometimes because my teacher did it. And so like, I think that I was taking all of these things she did and I, I would do them with my own programs. And, um, and so what I would see is that with my programs, each group within three years, not only had I doubled the program size 
um, except for one school. And with that school, it was high school. And we went from 90 to 120, which was awesome. But we doubled the program size at every other school. But then I ended up taking the students at at least one grade level higher than all of the teachers before. And we were getting superiors at assessment. That's not what it's about ultimately. Like we know that, but I, your question is really valid and really important because we also do know that if our musical offerings are low quality, the performances are low quality, that does tend to lend itself to like low self-confidence in our program sometimes, unfortunately, and a social identity that that actually says we're the outside musical group, not the in group. And, and we really want our students to feel very much that they belong within music. Um, and so, but I believe that the, the real way to do that is actually the slow way. And, and I very strongly not only believe it, but I have seen it time and time and time again, that the way we get there is by empowering them and giving them that intrinsic motivation. They can develop that intrinsic motivation over time. And I've seen like my students, some of my students that were the kid that literally my predecessor had said, that kid can't carry a tune to save his life. Let him drop orchestra. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want him in the program. I want him in the program. I have seen that kid take on the role as the fix it kid in the orchestra. And suddenly he's in my class nonstop. And that actually is ear training. Like we don't always think about this stuff. These kids that are in our class before school, during lunch, after school, you can't help but have your ears become more calibrated as you're sitting in a musical classroom all the time. You can't even help it. And so those students get that increased motivation and then increased loyalty. And then very naturally they get the fire and they just run with it if we let them, but we have to get out of the way. Most of the teachers that I see where they struggle with is actually getting out of the way and letting the kids run. And the thing is like in your book, you guys do such a great job of talking about like, get the students on the podium, let them conduct the group, let them compose a piece, let them arrange a piece, let them take ownership over their program. It's not your program. It is their program. And I think once we can really start to start to change our mindsets, from being the conductor, you know, that, that instead we are like a facilitator of these great musicians. Then I think that we can, we can have that slow burn that just fuels a fire to change an entire community. I agree 100%. <laughs> but it is, it is true because it's, it's a question we get a lot, right? We talk about this and, and people say, but, but the concert, the concert, and it just, it takes time. And yeah, no, that's great. All right. Well, so tell us now if people want to learn more about your awesome work with English language learners and really everything great that you're doing, how can they get in touch with you? How can they contact you? Where can they find you online? Well, you can always check out my website, AngelaAmmerman.com. That's super easy to get to. Um, and then, of course, I have a new book out with these amazing contributors. It's one of the coolest things I've ever done. Our um, contributors are actually music teachers from all over the country who are truly experts <laughs> in the field of music education. Yes. Uh, and, and they have been working with English language learners for years. Many of them actually have a background uh, as immigrants as well. And so it's just a really special book full of resources and success stories. Um, and then also kind of like encouragement for you to take what's in the book and apply it in your own situation. So I, I would love for you to check it out. It's called The Music Teacher's Guide to Engaging English Language Learners. You can find it on giamusic.com. Um, or if you go to my website, there's a direct link from there. And I'd love you to check that out. And then also I have a podcast called Hashtag Music at Love. I would love for you to check out as well. And I'm going to make sure to get these two on that podcast as well. So that'll be really fun for us to talk about empowering students there. Oh, um, fun. And yeah. And then you can, of course, always find me at George Mason uh, University. And we do some really exciting things in the community there as well. So check all of that out. Awesome. We'll make sure to have links to your website, your podcast, and of course, that fantastic book. Thank so. you. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We loved it. Um, I don't know. I'm excited. I want to come join your orchestra. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, please do. That would be so, we need an adult orchestra that just meets like once a month for us, right? That would be fun. That'd be fun. All right. Well, have a great night and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We'd also love for you to consider sharing this podcast with a friend and leaving a positive review. That's one of the best ways to get this message to new listeners.